life is interdependent. These are natural dependencies. Physical, mental, social, spiritual. A deficiency in any of these areas can create the climate for abnormal or false dependencies. casually or innocently, we first depend on a false crutch. It will likely grow on us and take hold of our will. It is always harmful, sometimes fatal. I'm a news reporter, and the three incidents you have just witnessed are reenactments of actual case histories. Of course, they are only part of the story, a part of the iceberg above water, as it were. But what lies below the surface? What causes people from all walks of life to choose a self-destructive negative way of life when there is so much that is wonderful, exciting, and positive all about us? As a reporter, I went below the surface to take a look at the dark world that lies there. I'd like to share with you the experiences of these three people and see if we can learn easily what they learned the hard way. Naturally, all names are fictitious to protect the innocent. First, there was Beth. That was over a year ago. I was 17 then. Well, actually, that's not quite right. The marijuana smoking began then. But things had been going on for a long time. Things that, well, sort of led up to all that. We live in a pretty nice part of town, suburbia. You know, the usual. Two cars and the whole bit. Dad had promised me one for my next birthday. <laughs> but that's another story. Dad's an accountant for a big company downtown. <laughs> Actually, he's more than an accountant. He's a vice president, too. Mom's an activist, I guess. Clubs and charities and bridge. You know, the usual. I don't mean to sound neglected. Yes, I guess I do. 
Anyway, something was wrong. Mom was always on the phone or dashing off to some meeting or something. I never seemed to get through to her in the last few years. It used to be we had lots to talk about, but no more. And since Dad had become a vice president of his company, he was busy too. Meetings and parties, and most of the time Mom went along to the parties. Used to be Dad would take us out to dinner once a week. But now he had a lot of responsibilities, and his mind was always off on some business or other. I know I sound sorry for myself, but that's the way I felt. I hated coming home to an empty house so often. It wasn't that I wanted Mom and Dad around all the time, but it got so they were never there when I needed them. And I had a lot of problems in my senior year. So, there it was, no communication. Of course, Mom and Dad thought I had my own friends, and I did. But with home like a sort of hotel, I started staying away more. I began to go out with Billy, and we really liked each other. Not just boy-girl stuff, but we really enjoyed each other. At least, that's the way I figured it. Of course, my schoolwork suffered. <sighs> I neglected my homework all the time. And then suddenly, it seemed like I wasn't having any fun anymore. I was miserable, and so was Billy, and we didn't know why. But I still couldn't seem to find any time to talk over things at home. I didn't even know what it was that was wrong. I just wanted to talk to my mother and father about anything. Then one day, Billy got some marijuana at school. It's not hard to come by, just ask. I was a bit nervous, but I was determined not to show it. I almost succeeded. After the first one, there was no difficulty. It was a regular thing after that, day or night. It helped me forget school and the problems I was having. So mom and dad had more important things to worry about. So what? Of course, the next day, there was still no communication with mom and dad. And school was still there, and nothing was really different. It was worse, because I had the feeling that time was whistling by, and I wasn't really accomplishing anything. Well, marijuana took care of the problems again for a little while. And one night, the whole thing blew up. Joan was feeling pretty sick. We'd all smoked quite a bit. Larry tried to help her, and Billy got really mad. I never saw him that way before. He acted like he was crazy. When I tried to get him to leave Larry alone, he turned on me and he came to me. Well, I was never so scared in my whole life. I ran all the way home. We live only a few blocks away. I couldn't get over it. Billy was always so gentle. I just blurted out everything. Mom and Dad just stared. They couldn't believe it. Their daughter, marijuana. We went into the house and had the first good, honest talk we'd had in years. Frank had a good, solid family background and an excellent record in school and college. He graduated with top honors and joined an architectural firm as a draftsman. Until that time, the future looked very good indeed. Then Frank began to drink. I, uh, I, I don't recall having any special problem. I mean, when you drink, you're supposed to be running away from some problem. I, I didn't have a problem. Of course, the, the crowd I went around with, they all drank, and I would have felt left out of things. And, there it is, my problem. I wanted to be one of the boys. I wanted to conform. Of course, I, I didn't realize it was a problem at the time. You never do. I used to eat lunch in a restaurant around the corner from where I work. I'm a draftsman in an architect's office. Usually, I ate with my buddy Dan from the office. But this day was different. I was with the new receptionist, Melly, And right off the bat, we liked each other. And that was the first of many dates. Melly was only 23 or so. She seemed a happy-go-lucky sort of girl. Her husband had been killed in Vietnam, and she had a two-year-old baby. And she drank quite a bit. 
But then so did I, so that was okay. All Mellie wanted to do was go out. All her money, and some of mine, went on the babysitter and clothes. Oh, she admitted it. She couldn't bear to be alone. But she loved the baby. She'd kiss it and hug it before she went out. But that was it. Mellie never wanted to give herself time to stop and think. Well, I should talk, because that was the way I'd gotten myself. But the difference between Mellie and I was that she knew she was miserable, and I didn't. And so we kept on the treadmill, parties, and when there wasn't a party, we sat in some bar and talked and talked, and sometimes listened to each other, but with less and less clarity. My work suffered after a while. I missed a few days, not many. Mostly I was just late, usually on Monday mornings. I made more mistakes, and that really bothered me. I always took pride in my work, but I couldn't or wouldn't stop and take stock of what was happening. Melly would often say, let's not go out tonight. Let's go back to my place, and I'll cook you the best meal you ever ate. And she did, too, quite a few times. But not without drinking. We depended on a drink for so long that we felt self-conscious without one. Oh, we'd try to talk, but it was awkward. Without a drink, we couldn't communicate. We couldn't handle the honesty we felt when we weren't high. It was easier to ignore problems and hope they'd go away. We didn't really get drunk very often, just enough liquor to kill the pain. What pain? The pain of stopping, looking around you, seeing where you were going, and maybe admitting that you were headed in the wrong direction and had already wasted a lot of time. We kept saying tomorrow, next week, but sometimes there's only today or tonight and you've lost your chance. That's the way it was with Melly and me. We planned to have just one drink. I'd had a rough day at the office, and then we were going someplace nice for dinner. But by the time we sat at the bar, Melly had decided she wasn't in the mood for dinner out. She hadn't been sleeping well. She just wanted to go home and get some sleep. So I suggested she have a couple of drinks, but help her sleep better. Well, a couple became three, and we called it quits. I don't remember too much for a few minutes then. The noise of a horn, brakes, and the crash. And then, Melly was dead. She was dead. And I never really knew her at all. And I'd loved her. And I don't think she ever really knew that either. For weeks, I went on a bender to end all benders. noticed that there were leaves on the tree outside my window. And up until that moment, I, I couldn't recall ever having seen the tree. And I remembered how Mellie had loved trees, and I wondered why we'd never taken a walk in the park. I decided it was now or never to change my values, my direction, to change my life. And then there was Max. I left school at the end of one fall term and never went back. I had all the excuses I needed. My mother and father separated, and I spent half of each summer with my father. My mother wasn't a very happy person to live with. At that time, I thought she was just mean. Now I can see she was just lonely. I think she missed my father pretty much, and I guess I was a constant reminder of him. In any case, we didn't communicate. Frankly, I never tried. I don't know about her. Maybe she tried, and I wouldn't hear. Who knows how you start to freeze yourself into a corner. This was home for over a year. I made a few bucks taking bets, messages, running errands, taking a package here, bringing one there. If my mother wondered where I was, she didn't show it. Maybe she was afraid to ask. One day, my father followed me from the pool hall. He was real mad. Told me to never go near that place again. It was bad. If I got into trouble, it meant trouble for him. That's all that was worrying him. I told him that, and he blew up. Right then and there, I decided I'd really give the old man something to worry about. I knew one of the men I ran for was hustling heroin. I'd never even taken marijuana, but I was fed up, and I was going to show the world how mad I could get. I guess at first he thought I was trying to lead in the cops. 
but when he realized I was serious, he just stared at me like he couldn't believe his ears. Nobody, he says, but nobody goes out of his way to buy trouble like that. Heroin is for suckers. Why did I want to be a sucker? Stay away from that stuff, he said. Can you imagine? A pusher telling me to stay away from it. My father never took that much time with me. But I was determined, and when you go looking for trouble, it's not hard to find. Inside a week, I was on heroin. Inside a month, I was hooked. For the next six or seven months, I was like that. Half the time in orbit, half the time begging. I had no pride anymore. Oh man, if my father had seen me then. But I guess I wasn't as far gone as I might have been. One day I dragged myself to the nearest hospital and asked for help. What I went through for the next few days, I wouldn't wish on Satan himself. I begged them to kill me. I screamed and cried and begged for drugs, any drugs now. But inside of seven days, I walked out, clean and weak. I got myself a job at a gas station. I was always good with my hands on cars. I could take one apart and put it back together before I was 14. So for two months, everything went fine. I felt I was getting along. I had responsibility. Then one afternoon, this guy made a crack. Now it seems silly, but I was tired and this guy was always needling me. Instead of giving myself a talking to, I began to feel sorry for myself. That's all it took. I had a wild, delirious night, and the fix lasted for several days. But then, that afternoon, I was dying. I thought five o'clock would never come. I needed a fix so bad, my stomach was tied in knots. The kid wanted me to check his brakes, said they were giving him trouble. Felt like maybe they were low on fluid. If only I hadn't been left alone that day. Anybody working with me would have known something was wrong. How wrong, I didn't know until I turned and saw the can of fluid. I could have sworn I had put it in, but there it was, unopened. two days. She told them they'd had the brakes checked. False dependencies are basically antisocial. They not only mislead the person into relying on abnormal aids, but they also alienate him from those who might otherwise help. All life is interdependent. And if any one of us is denied access, whether through his own fault or someone else's, to the natural dependencies that society and nature provide, he may well lean on false crutches that must inevitably betray him. Beth's parents, for example, relied on purely material things to keep their daughter happy. A good allowance, a new car, everything except themselves, their time, their love, their guidance. So she turned elsewhere. But today she has made a new choice and today, she's a new person. I feel like I never knew what was going on before. I've learned to be positive rather than negative, like the garden and the flowers. You know, they were always there before, but I never really saw them and how beautiful they are. Everything is different. I don't need any crutch, as you call it. And for the first time, I actually enjoy learning. It's a pretty good life, if you go after it. Well, of course, nothing can change the past, but I've made my choice how I'm going to live my life. I'm working harder and, I think, better. No more crutches. And uh, I haven't lost any friends, at least not any that count. I've got a promotion coming up, too. It's, uh, it's working out. I'm on top of things now. And believe it or not, I do some youth counseling once a week. <laughs> it doesn't sound much like the old me, does it? But I know the score now, and I think I can help some of these kids to give their lives meaning and purpose. Like the song says, it's a great, wide, wonderful world, 
but you have to open your eyes and look at it. Max paid heavily for his dependency on drugs. Several years in the penitentiary and the knowledge that he was responsible for the death of two persons he didn't even know. But those days are only a grim memory now, and Max has begun a new life. How goes the work? Okay. Pretty good, in fact. I like that paycheck every Friday. How has it been for you since you got out? Well, I guess I'm lucky not to be in jail for life. I still get nightmares now and then and get a craving for a fix once in a while. But when that happens, I call one of two numbers. Pastor Maxwell or Deputy Baker. They've both helped me, and I help other fellows any way I can. Junkies, I know how they feel, what it's like to depend on a needle. I'm grateful for my chance at a new life. I learned things the tough way. You work, you get paid for it. I like that. There's a satisfaction in a hard day's work. It's as though I'm giving something of myself. I know it sounds funny, but I have good friends now, and I'm trying to help people. It's a pretty good life if you work at it. Max, like the others, has learned that there is no substitute for the natural dependencies. We must establish a healthy, positive set of values, learn what we can and cannot depend upon so that we may live life in all its fullness. For all life is interdependent, and the moment we recognize this and apply it to our own lives, there will be a new beginning. <laughs>